Hello, it's you again. Here, come by the fire and warm your bones. I'll have Stedman mix up some toddies. Welcome again to the Gallery of Curiosities. I remain, as always, your humble host, Osgood. The frost is on the pumpkin, as they say. Well, perhaps I don't, but that's neither here nor there. It's nearly time for you all to set your clocks back. And I do mean your clocks, because I do not allow clocks here in the gallery. No, 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 no. That being said, I do have an extensive collection of winding handles here, which I've decided to put on exhibit. Never mind how I acquired them. That's, uh... That's my business. So, this evening's exhibit takes us north to the province of Quebec and comes from author Kate Hartfield. Ms. Hartfield is the author of the historical fantasy novel Armed in Her Fashion and two Alice Payne time travel novellas. She also writes interactive fiction, including the Road to Canterbury. Her fiction has been shortlisted for the Nebula, Locus, Aurora, Sunburst, and Crawford Awards, and the story you are about to hear was longlisted for the Sunburst Award. Find her on the web at heartfieldfiction.com or on Twitter at Kate Hartfield. The Seven O'Clock Man by Kate Hartfield Read by Wilson Fowley Jacques did not throw up his hands to protect himself from the eggs. He did not duck the cabbage core. He let the piss from overhead pots trickle through his hair. This was why he never wore a hat when it was time to wind the clock. Having long since sloughed off the capacity to flinch, he walked the narrow streets of La Garenne like an automaton, carrying his lantern although the sun had not yet set. It would have been kinder if he were an automaton, if it were made evident to everyone that he had no choice. The town square opened before him like a surprise, as it did every evening. It was some small relief to walk out of range of the town's windows. Jacques rounded the bricked corner of the bake shop, and there it was, its dirt trampled as hard as stone. La Garenne liked to think of itself as a second Montréal, but the truth was there was a half a day's hard ride and a half century of progress between La Garenne and Montréal, between La Garenne and anywhere. The square was very nearly empty now, at eighteen minutes before seven. Jacques did not usually come this late. He liked to wind the clock in plenty of time, but his wife was in one of her bleak moods, bleaker than most, and he had feared to leave her with a pot on the fire, feared to leave her alone with only little Felix to help her. The only people left in the square at this hour, so close to seven o'clock, were those with no children at home, mendicants, frocked and otherwise. A few people with faces as wilted as his own, who watched him as they watched all the works of God, as if they expected nothing better. The clock had grown in the five years since its appearance, spread like a black fungus on the face of the squat grey tower. When it appeared, the year Jacques was sixteen, it had been nothing but a great round clock face, brass wheels and arms clicking against the grey stone, with a man-sized archway on either side of it, and in each archway a black painted door. In the years since, as the children had been taken one by one, new doors opened up, above and below, off to one side or the other. At a quarter of the hour, the little black doors opened. The clock kept angry time. In each open door, a statue of a child appeared. Jacques watched, speaking their names in his mind as a penance. 
There was little Augustin with his stick and wheel. His chubby wooden face looked off to the right as if a horse and cart were about to run him down. There was Louise, who was perfectly still always until she spun her little pirouette. On the other side, Marie-Claude with her cat, and Jérôme, nearly twenty-one, a man grown, smoking his pipe. And in the middle, gliding across from one door to the other almost before he could see them and mark them, Pierre, Jacques, Marie Marguerite, and Anne. Eight children in five years. A bleak harvest. Most of the children were Mohawk, like him, had been born with other names, like him. Little Louise was blonde. Her father had been a wealthy merchant. The seven o'clock man did not make exceptions. The governor had said, when he first built the clock, all children who act like savages will be treated as savages, and all children who keep order, who say their prayers and get into their beds at seven o'clock will be good French children in my eyes, and in the eyes of the Intendant of New France, and the eyes of God. The chimes rang out tunelessly, and Jacques bent his head. He trudged to the door on the ground and opened it with his little iron key. He had fifteen minutes for his work. He climbed the short ladder, up through the trap door, up through a second to the top floor of the tower, and set the lantern on its hook. There were six wheels to wind. The first four were the big ones, two-handed handles that took all his breath and left him puffing. Each one pulled a weight to the top of the tower, weights that would slowly drop over the next two days, and power the gears of the clock. The first weight was for the clock itself. Click, 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 click. The second was for the chimes of the quarter hours. Click, 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 click. The third was for the bells of the hour. Click, 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 click. The fourth wheel, the wheel that drove the automaton, stuck and would not turn. The weight was nearly all the way down to the bottom. Jacques pushed until he could feel the veins in his temple pulsing. He cursed and forgave himself. He took off his gloves and spat on his hands. No good. There was something in the gears. With a groan, Jacques leaned forward, stretching his hand into the works, scraping the gummy oil and grime out of the wheel. Damn Marie Claire and her broken mind. It took him several long minutes, but he got the gear clear and the wheel moved. Click, 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 click. This fourth wheel was for the stolen children and for the two other automata, the ones in the big doors on either side of the clock face. They rolled in and out of their doors using the same gear train as the children. But there remained two more wheels to turn, because soon the seven o'clock man and his dog would walk out of the clock. Down he went to the middle level, carrying his lantern, setting it on the nail. Jacques checked the watch the governor, always cruel in his kindnesses, had left him in his will. Mother of God, two minutes left. He was a fool, had always been a fool. He took too many risks, even now, left too many openings in his life for the devil to come in. If the seven o'clock man did not walk, his Felix, his darling boy, would die, his heart winding down to a stop. Jacques should have left earlier. He should have trusted that Marie Claire would be fine, there was always something keeping him at home. Some pot burning on the fire. Some scrape on little Felix's knee. Some reminder that his boy was still soft brown flesh despite the wheel in his back. But that if Jacques ever failed even once, Felix would be up here in the clock, wooden like all the rest. Some hope that the sorrow would clear from his beloved Marie Claire's dark eyes, and she would look at him just for a moment as she used to. In the first year of his task, the governor used to come with him to watch him wind the wheels, watch the weights rise. You have done well, Jacques, he would say. In rectitude there is strength. You are learning to regulate yourself. And in bringing order to yourself, you bring order to La Garenne. The town is grateful. A few weeks later, the governor had caught fever and died. How astonishing that a sorcerer could die of fever. 
Now the old man was rotting in his tomb while his decrees still staggered on in relentless motion, while the town showered its gratitude upon Jacques' head every second night. And what did they do about it? They could have burned the clock down, set fire to the seven o'clock man. Jacques had to be grateful they did not, for the sake of his own boy. But the town hated him while praising the clock, praising the old governor's rules, saying that, yes, order was necessary. The new governor was no sorcerer, but he was a weak-willed man, who was afraid of what might happen if the rules relaxed, if the clock were no longer there to keep the people in their place. The priests said the clock was a miracle, God's will, and the people believed that. Yet still they cursed Jacques. Jacques stepped out onto the beam beside the seven o'clock man, reached over the brass wheel on its back. His last and most despicable task was to wind it and the dog. Jacques put his gloves back on, and not only because of the stink of oil and metal that got onto his hands and kept him awake on clock-winding nights. One day, he felt sure, the seven o'clock man would turn around and look at him here inside the tower. Jacques feared the face that had belonged to his former owner, Monsieur Martin. It had frightened him in life, but in the way of living things, a fright that sped the heart, not a fright that chilled the blood. It was not mere fancy this fear Jacques held that the seven o'clock man might turn to stare at Jacques, even before the thing was wound. Who among the living could understand the decaying sorcery that made the seven o'clock man leave the clock and walk abroad? The sorcery that made him see the children who were out of bed and turn them into wood. Why, God, couldn't that sorcery work without wheels and gears and leave Jacques out of it? You must not think of this as punishment, but as a blessing, as penance is not punishment, but expiation, the governor had said. You were born a savage, but now you have a chance to redeem that condition. And sometimes Jacques would nod and think, Yes, Governor, I am trying. And sometimes Jacques would think, My father was a warrior. He finished winding the seven o'clock man and scrambled over on the slippery worn beams to the dog. In here, in the workings of the machine, the light from the lantern was mutilated and strange. He had barely finished winding the dog when there was a loud clack, and the gears overhead groaned and whirred. The doors flung outward and let the gray light of a summer evening in. Jacques nearly wept with relief. He held onto a beam and panted for a moment. For two more nights, Felix was safe, because Jacques had done his awful duty. Somewhere, someone cried the alarm, as if the bells were not warning enough. Bonhomme setter! Out the seven o'clock man slid, never turning to look at Jacques, but performing his task as he always did. He flipped his right hand, in time with the great hour bells of the clock, as if he were ringing a handbell. In his left hand, he held a cane. Jacques could see the near-empty square below. If it were not a sin, he might leap out into that void, if Felix would not suffer for it. The bells boomed seven times in his ears as he scrambled back onto the platform, took his lantern, and climbed down the ladder. As he emerged, the seven o'clock man and the dog were just finishing their hourly ritual. The hand had flipped seven times. The black dog had turned his head right, left, right, left, right, left, right, until he was looking expectantly at his master. Then they both slid out into the air and floated down. They hit the ground and slid forward, the dog still looking from side to side as they went. The evening's hunt had begun. All children in La Garenne must be in bed, or the seven o'clock man would take them. Felix ran through the streets looking for his father. He was used to Mamma's moods, but he had never seen Mamma's face so still as if she were dead. She blinked. She even closed her eyes and sighed and opened them again. She answered him with a muttered word or two, 
but she wouldn't talk to him. His legs were so tired, but as he rounded the corner by the bakery, he felt the wheel in his back slip and catch and turn. Papa was winding the clock. That meant Felix had another two days of life and a little more life in his legs, as if he'd taken a big breath. It also meant the seven o'clock man was abroad. Felix had always been curious about what the seven o'clock man looked like when he was alive. He had been a rich man, Mama told him, a rich man named Monsieur Martin, with a beautiful African slave named Marie Claire. That was Mama. Were you happy in those days? Felix would ask. Sometimes, Mama would say. In the same house, there was a Mohawk boy of just the same age, not a slave, but a ward, taken from a village in battle. That was Papa. And what was Papa like? Jacques was just like any other boy, except he was bright and sharp as a knife, and he made Marie Claire laugh, and when he looked at her, she loved him with her whole heart. She knew she always would. Marie Claire's tummy grew big, with Felix inside it. Monsieur Martin had been angry. It was all right for slaves to have children, but they had to wait for instructions first about who the father should be. The governor was angrier still at Monsieur Martin. He said he had had great hopes for his Mohawk boy Jacques, that he could rise above his race and show the world what came of Christian education, and now what? Then came the uprising. Le Mute des Sauvages, people called it, although there were a few French boys involved too. The governor had sent troops to destroy five Mohawk villages, the same villages where his soldiers had taken the children from a few years before. They burned the crops and slaughtered the people. These were Felix's grandparents, Mama explained. That's why Papa was so angry. Is he still angry? Felix would ask. Of course not, Mama would say, as if she was afraid someone had heard. They signed a peace treaty, the Mohawks and the French, not long after that but that was after Papa and the other boys set fire to the governor's mansion. The governor was able to escape. Some said, even then, he must have been a sorcerer. The following Sunday after Mass, the governor spoke in La Garenne's town square. He said the children were running wild. There must be order. There must be virtue. There would be punishments. There would be a curfew for anyone younger than 21. That was when the clock appeared. It was a very lazy man who let his slave get a baby in her belly without permission, the governor said. Laxity, disorder, vice. So Monsieur Martin became the seven o'clock man as an example, and Papa had to wind the clock as another example, and Felix had a magic wheel put into his back. As an example? he asked Mama. No, she said, to make sure that Papa would do his duty. That was what Mama told Felix on one of the days when Mama would talk. That old governor was dead now. He had given Mama and Papa their little house, near where they used to live with Monsieur Martin. Father had told him that. But the clock and the seven o'clock man still wound down every two days, just like Felix. Felix had peeped out of the window once, and his mother had yelled at him, said he was acting like a savage, out of control. Then she cried. Today, when Papa left, she said nothing. When Felix asked her if it was time to get into bed, if it was seven o'clock yet, she only stared, as if she were turning into a statue too. Felix had cried out, screaming out the open window. No one came. Whether because it was almost seven o'clock, or because it was his voice calling out, he did not know. To his face, they called him Petit Bonhomme, unkindly. He could only guess what they called him when he could not hear. Felix had given up on trying to understand. He only wished someone had come when he called out, My mother is ill! I need help! He had gone first to Madame Bourget's house, near his own. Madame Bourget was kind. She did not stare at the wheel in his back, or call him names, or throw things at his father, and sometimes she brought them extra food when Mama was at her worst, and it was clock-winding night for Papa. But she had not come today and when he pounded on her door, there was no answer. He skidded around a corner and ran into Papa. Papa looked stunned. His hair was matted. He blinked as if he had something in his eyes, probably something nasty because it was a clock night. Felix, what in the name of God? 
Papa picked him up under one arm, although Felix was nearly six, and so big that his feet dragged on the ground as his father walked. Into the narrowest alley Papa ducked, his breath coming fast. He carried his lantern in the other hand. Felix wished there were a wheel on his father's back that he could wind, to give his father the strength he needed to get home quickly. Felix, for God's sake, don't you know what will happen if the seven o'clock man catches you? Of course Felix knew. All the children of La Garenne knew. He would turn into wood like the seven o'clock man and his black dog. He would live inside a little painted doorway in the clock. He supposed he would keep the wheel he already had in his back. He knew because on those nights when Papa did not have to wind the clock, he put Felix into bed at 6.30 and held him close and would not let him out, not even to use the pot. And once, when Felix had been little and crying about something and would not stay in the bed, Papa had held him down and screamed, Just go to sleep, for God's sake! Felix did not like Papa at bedtime. He preferred Mama when Mama was herself. It's Mama, Felix said. She is bad tonight. She frightens me. She let you out? She couldn't stop me. Wouldn't, you mean. One of her moods, that's all it is. I wish she would snap out of it. Felix did not want to defend his mamma. He wanted papa to make her talk again. It's bad, papa. I think she must be very sick. To Felix's surprise, tears ran down his own face and his nose bubbled. Papa let out a heavy sigh, hoisted his son higher in his arm, and ran. Felix's feet banged against papa's knees. Papa's arm pressed against Felix's back wheel just a little uncomfortably. The world jounced, and Felix could not watch it anymore. Nothing would stay in one place. He buried his face in Papa's filthy wet shirt. Papa had him. "'You must not take such risks, my boy,' said Papa. "'Not for anyone.' "'But, Papa, don't we love Mama?' "'Yes, we love her,' said Jacques. "'That is how the devil gets in.' Felix said nothing because he might sob and make too much noise. But he wanted to know, gets into where? Into La Garenne? Into Felix? Into Mama? Around a corner and they came into a thin alley, almost home. Papa's lantern lit the houses on either side of the alley with orange light, like a giant's fire lighting the walls of a cave. The alley smelled of old piss. There was the door of their little house at the end of the alley and as it crossed in front of their front door, a dog turned its head and looked at them. A black dog. A wooden dog. Felix saw the wheel in its back, the sorcery in the sweep of its head toward him, away from him, toward him. The dog turned its whole body to match the direction of its head and slid toward them. Jacques stumbled backward a few steps, then swung around. One of Felix's shoes fell to the street, Behind them, the seven o'clock man stood with his hand out as if he were waiting for alms. In the other, he held his cane. His motionless face was wooden like the dog's, but he wore real wool and silk, and his hair was a real wig like a rich girl's doll. Had Monsieur Martin worn that very shirt, that yellowed cravat, that same long brown wig in his natural life? You can't have him, said Papa. The seven o'clock man slid toward him, his empty right hand turning up and down as if he were ringing a handbell. Felix peeked over Papa's arm. The dog was still sliding toward them, his head turning again, left, right. A pigeon fluttered out of the church tower. A window shutter opened above. You cannot take him, Papa screamed. I have done as I was told. His voice echoed. Somewhere, not far, the bark of a real dog ended in a stifled yelp. If only Mama had not let her face get so still. If only she would have looked at Felix as if she were looking out of her own eyes just once. He would like that better than a bedtime story. He would get into bed every night well before seven o'clock, if only he knew Mama was well. Mama! The cry bubbled out of him, wet with tears. He sounded like a baby, he knew, but he couldn't help it. If only Mama knew that he and Papa were coming for her. If only she knew that they loved her. Their door opened, and Mama came out like a figure in a clock. Mama, he said again, reaching out his arms over Papa's shoulder. The dog leaped up, as if it thought Felix were trying to pat its wooden head. The jaws clamped down, and the metal teeth bit into his hand. He screamed. Mama screamed, too. Her face moved again, and she was there. She was his Mama again. 
She ran toward him and pulled the dog off, but his hand only hurt more as the teeth tore into his flesh. The dog did not growl or snarl. It made no sound at all. Papa eased him down to the ground and began to pound on the dog's head with his fist. He squatted and tried to pull the jaws open. Behind you, Jacques! Mama cried. Jacques turned. The hands of the seven o'clock man were gloved in soft kid leather that had been white. These were the hands that held the punishment in them, the long wooden cane that reached out toward Felix, hook first. He would not take his boy. Jacques picked up the lantern, and if he hesitated a moment, it was because he wondered what was left of Monsieur Martin in this abomination. Monsieur Martin had not been a particularly good man, but he had been a man. When the lantern smashed against the wooden head, the wig went up like corn silk, each curled strand glowing crimson until the seven o'clock man was a walking torch, its gloved hands still reaching for them, the cane not yet on fire, protected by distance and the leather of the gloves. Jacques kicked the dog, but it did not yelp or loosen its grip. So he reached around its body, lighter than a real one's would have been, and picked it up. Carry Felix, he gasped to Marie Claire. Let's get him away from here. Marie Claire was herself again, for the moment. She had always been a mystery to him. She was a mystery to herself. She was born in Portugal, Monsieur Martin had said, a slave born of slaves, but she did not remember her own parents. Neither of them ever spoke of their parents, of anything in the past. Jacques and Marie Claire ran, or rather lumbered, as Felix's body shook with pain and sobs, the pudgy little arm dangling from those horrible teeth, the dog's legs moving patiently as clockwork. Behind them, the orange light grew brighter and hotter as if the door to hell was coming for them, ready to swallow them up. As the man's cane knocked against his shoulders, Jacques pushed Felix away, pushed him into the doorway, into the house. Jacques turned and grabbed the cane out of the man's arms, but the cane came too easily. It hit Felix behind him. He saw the dog open its maw to let go of his boy's bleeding hand. He felt all the aches disappear and heard his heart stop, the way one can almost hear a clock stop, if one is listening very carefully at just the right moment, the way the world stopped the moment he first saw the face of his beautiful boy. Felix's face was turning to wood, too, in front of him. Jacques tried to reach for Felix again, but his muscles were inert. He could not open his hand to drop the cane. Some force was pulling him down the length of the alley. The little house and the door and Marie Claire and the dog grew smaller as Jacques and Felix slid backward away from them, away from the burning wreck as it fell to the cobbles. The morning was gray and wet. Jacques could see it through the crack of the clock door. He could smell the damp and fear in the air, and the fire that still lingered in his own scorched and filthy shirt. All his senses survived, like phantoms of life. He took some comfort in how quiet it was, here where he could almost hear his son breathing across the gears and beams. Felix was there with him. Jacques tried not to be grateful for that. Perhaps death would have been better for the boy. But at least now Jacques knew that his son's mind, his loving little heart, was still in the world. He knew he might even see Felix catch a glimpse of that face, now motionless. A door banged. Someone was coming up the stairs. My dears, he heard. He would have turned around if he could, for it was Marie Claire's voice. I'm sorry, she said, and he knew that timbre the sound her voice made when she was not allowing herself to cry. He had never seen her cry. And Jacques wanted to say, you are blameless. But what did his wooden mind understand of blame? What could he comprehend of the condition of even his own soul in that moment of flame and anger? What of all the moments of cold decision that came before? My dear, I do not think they can hear you, said a second person. Madame Bouget, whether they can hear me or not, I must tell them. I must tell them that I will come to wind the clock for as long as I live. And if they hang me for setting the fire, then you will come, won't you, Madame Bourget? And you will come even if I live, on those nights when I cannot, if... if I cannot. You will. Say you will. I will. Of course I will, child. 
Now let's get on with it and be gone. Jacques listened as his darling Marie Claire wound the cranks that pulled the weights, listened to the sound of her sobs that finally came, the sound he had never heard before. But what shall we do? he heard Madame Bouget whisper. If they walk, as the seven o'clock man and that dog did, what shall we do if he hunts the children? I shall never wind them, said Marie Claire. I wind the clock only. They will move on its track, but they cannot move on their own. I hope. And if you are wrong, if there is some sorcery stronger than gears and wheels, then I will bring a torch and watch him burn as I watched the other, and I will know that it is for the good of his soul. Then his wife stood before him and kissed his wooden lips, while Jacques could not move, only feel the dryness of her lips and the wetness of her tears. The clock loses time now. The gears lock and skip. The old governor's sorcery is aging, cracking. Jacques has found that at seven o'clock, at the very moment when the gears turn his body toward the clock face, he can, through his own will, reach out his hands toward the figure on the other side of it. He does this every day like clockwork, although he can never reach far enough. Every evening, when he is out over the square, Jacques can hear the murmurs. They call him Jacques of the Clock now, with affection, or sometimes Le Jacques Mar. They call his boy Petit Bonhomme. They say Jacques Martin saved the town from a monster. They swear to visitors that the story is true. He is glad, at least, that he never leaves the clock, that his punishment is not Monsieur Martin's punishment. He is also grateful for the cowardly clockwinders of La Garenne, for the men and women who take turns winding now that Marie Claire and Madame Bourget are long dead, now that there is no danger and no sin in it. He cannot but be grateful, for though the clockwinders keep him in this purgatory of stillness for most of every day, while the rats run over his body and the bats swoop, and he can hear the sighs of the ghosts of children all up and down the clock tower around him, Though the clockwinders give him this torture of perpetual inaction, they also give him the daily hope of one more glimpse of his son. Clockwinders. I knew a clockwinder once. Nosy little fellow, always around just when you're trying to get some work done. <laughs> but I haven't seen him for quite a long time. That isn't over. At any rate, the hour is late. It's time for us to close up for the evening. Do take care and come visit us again next time at the Gallery of... Curiosities. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Story copyrights remain with the authors. Our theme song, as always, is Ashes, Ashes by Deus Ex Vapora Machina. This episode was produced in October of 2019. For full show notes, do visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. That day will come.